<laughs> Welcome everyone to the Traverse Area District Library Zoom programming. We're here tonight with Alana, who is a member of AmeriCorps. And so she's volunteering for uh, through the American Red Cross to show us this presentation tonight on um, thunderstorms and how to be prepared during thunderstorms, which September is disaster. I said that wrong, is, what is it? Disaster Preparedness Month? Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah exactly. So, <laughs> <laughs> so she's gonna talk about, well, each week we're gonna have a different subject and tonight is thunderstorms and a little bit about power outages. Um, you can find most of our programs. We will record this one in particular uh, and post it on our YouTube channel. But most of our programs are tattle.org slash events. You can find out what the other subjects are. And then posted on our YouTube channel is tattle, not just books. If you have any questions anytime or at the end of this presentation, um, you can utilize your chat function and um, we'll answer those questions. But thank you very much, Alana, for coming and it's all yours. Thank you. Yeah, thanks to the library for having me. Um, last week we talked about home fires and like you said, today we're gonna talk about thunderstorms and thanks everyone for joining us. And I hope you join us again for our flood presentation um, and our snowstorm presentation, which will be at the end of this month, because as we all know, we're heading into winter. <laughs> so I'll just start by sharing my screen here. I think. There we go. All right. Look good, Betsy. Okay, great. Okay, so we're going to talk about thunderstorms today, as I said, but first we'll start with just some general preparedness uh, tips that the Red Cross recommends for all disasters that happen in your area. So odds are that disaster will strike. The fact simply is that disasters happen and they happen often with little or no warning anywhere and at any time. They can affect any community and we know it's a disaster if normal response systems are overwhelmed, people are hurt, and property is damaged or destroyed. So every year, community, communities across the United States face disasters, and we see a lot of thunderstorms in particular that do damage to houses and other property. So what about Northern Michigan in particular, or even Traverse City in particular? Not all of these um, hazards or disasters apply to our area, obviously. I don't think we're having any hurricanes, for example, but some of them do. And if you travel regularly, you want to keep in mind, you know, what type of disasters could happen in that area and be prepared for those as well. But here in Northern Michigan, we basically face these disasters on the screen here. Home fires, tornadoes, thunderstorms, wildfires, floods, extreme heat, and winter storms, of course. And we could even add pandemics, for example, to this list. They kind of fit that definition we just talked about earlier. But today we'll be talking about thunderstorms, as I said. But we can apply all of these tips to these disasters. So in any of these disasters that we're talking about, a lot of people assume that someone else will be there to help them, but resources just aren't there to support everybody immediately. First responders, disaster organizations like the Red Cross, government agencies and hospitals are doing their best, but they're just staffed for normal day-to-day -day operations and resources end up being really limited during a disaster. So we have to depend on ourselves first and foremost, because like we were saying earlier, you know, roads could be impassable, utilities could be turned off, hospitals and first responders might be overwhelmed, and banks, grocery stores, gas stations, pharmacies, schools, workplaces, all those things that you need could be closed for days on end. I think we all have experience with that. So you don't wanna count on receiving help right away. You want to be prepared to help yourself, anyone else in your household, even your pets. 
neighbors, older adults, and doing this preparation can help us stay safe, adapt to challenges, and recover more quickly. So the Red Cross has split this into three very easy steps, which are get a kit, make a plan, and be informed. So your kit will contain all the supplies you need if you ever need to evacuate for a disaster. Um, make a plan is just identifying the steps you need to take to respond to specific disasters. And be informed is just learning how to get information if a disaster occurs and what resources there is in your community. So let's look at all of these in a little bit more detail. So the first one was get a kit. So we recommend that you have two kits. One is your household kit, which has supplies for about three days, but two weeks is even better. And then a go bag, which is a mobile version of that same kit. So supplies for about three days, in case you need to evacuate uh, quickly. And this is something, you know, you'd put in like maybe a backpack or a duffel bag, something, you know, more portable than the household kit. Also, you should consider making one for your vehicle. So if a disaster ever strikes, you know, while you're in your vehicle, you have your supplies ready to go. And you could put in, you know, more customizable things specific to vehicle emergencies. So inside of this kit, you'll have essential supplies for each member of your household, and you'll also customize it for personal health or medical needs, pets, and disasters common to your area. You'll also wanna keep it fresh. You don't wanna use expired materials. So we recommend you replace items about every six months. So this may sound uh, pretty intense, but you just think about what you use on a daily basis and what your plan would be if those resources were limited or not available. So there's some examples on this slide right here, you know, non-perishable food, some bottled water, a battery or batteries and a flashlight, a radio, first aid kit, and some medication if you can put that in there as well. So how much water should you put in this? On the slide, we only have two bottles, but we recommend that you should have at least one gallon of water per person per day. And that's half for drinking and half for sanitation. Because like I said earlier, your utilities could be shut off and potentially for a long period of time. So additional kit supplies that we also recommend, I know this is a long list, but extra batteries for phones, flashlights, and power dependent mobility devices, oxygen, or other assistive technology needs, if that applies to you, a seven day supply of medications and medical items, if you need that, sanitation and personal hygiene items, copies of personal documents, such as medical information, proof of address, deed lease to your home, passports, birth certificates, insurance policies, um, always a good idea to plan ahead and make sure you have insurance policies in place for these disasters. Um, photos of loved ones, just in case you get separated, for example. Cell phone charger battery and household member and emergency contact information. Extra cash, emergency blankets, and maps of the area because you won't be able to potentially use the map on your phone if the power goes out or if you can't charge your phone if it's broken, things like that. So please don't feel overwhelmed by this. This is just you know, a few recommendations, just general recommendations. There's many more great options that you could add to a kit. And like I said earlier, you wanna personalize it so that it fits you in particular or fits anyone else in your household. So you might wanna consider making a special kit for your kids, for example, or a kit for your pet or service animals, or just add things into your own kits for them, such as water, food, identification tags, or anything else you need, like a leash for a dog. So our next step was make a plan. So different disasters, different hazards require you to take different actions. And you wanna make sure you include the right details for each of these different disasters. So just some general things are 
how you would evacuate your home, where you would meet in that situation, where you would stay, if you had to shelter in place, what would you do, how to communicate in the event of a disaster, and prepping those important records so that they're ready to go in the event of a disaster as well. So that might mean packing them up, you know, in some kind of safe uh, container or making copies so that you have them prepared, things like that. And you wanna make sure you also consider household members with access or functional needs and your pets again, and any service animals as well. Those individuals with access and functional needs might need to prepare a little bit differently. So we recommend that they create a personal support network that can help you plan and provide assistance if a disaster happens and try not to depend on just one person in this network, include a minimum of three people and then complete a personal assessment of your own functional abilities and possible needs during and after a disaster situation. And then you'll just want to practice and make sure you update this plan as needed, and which goes for everyone. We want to make sure we create these plans, but also update them regularly so that they're actually functional and, you know, usable in the event of a disaster. And just a note about pets as well. Generally, Red Cross shelters cannot accept pets just because of health and safety concerns. So it's a great idea to get a better idea of what you would do with your pet and if there ever was a disaster. You can generally contact your local emergency management agency for a list of pet friendly shelters. So that way you know that first bullet point on there is where to evacuate in the event that something did happen. All right, and now we're moving right along to our third step, which is to be informed. And by attending our presentation today, you are already on the road to being a little bit more informed than you were, so good for you. <laughs> but other ways that we can also be informed is identifying how we will get information. So we want to know how our community warns of an incoming disaster. So maybe there's outdoor sirens, or maybe there's a smartphone alert that you need to sign up for. You want to know that information ahead of time. We also like to recommend that you have a battery powered NOAA radio so that you can listen for weather alerts, even if the power goes out. Um, or you can also generally listen to your local TV station for this updated information, you know, if the power doesn't go out. <laughs> and then you wanna make sure you can understand what these weather alerts are saying. So I have watch versus a warning on there, which we'll go much more in depth on later. Uh, we also recommend that you know your neighbors because they can be a great source of community information or if somebody needs help. Um, and we recommend that you know about an area before you travel there. So for example, if you spend half the year in Florida, you wanna know what disaster risks they face there and how to protect yourself. And always follow instructions from authorities in the event of a disaster. So for example, we're talking about thunderstorms today. Please don't drive through flooded roads, for example. That can be very dangerous. So things like that, always follow instructions from authorities. And then down at the bottom there, I have creating emergency contact cards, which is something that can be very helpful. So once again, if your cell phone is not functioning, um, you're not gonna have those contacts available to you. So it's great if you write them down and have them ready ahead of time. So also a good idea is to decide one specific emergency contact and have everyone in your household memorize that phone number. We don't really memorize phone numbers anymore. I know I don't because they're all stored in my phone. So this way you have at least someone that everyone can call in the event of emergency. And again, another recommendation is to have one emergency contact that lives outside of your city or maybe even outside of your state. So that if something is happening in your area, there's someone you can contact to tell that you're safe who lives outside of the area, they're not impacted by whatever is going on. And that 
I'll just pull up our very own Red Cross emergency app because it's a great way to stay informed on those weather alerts. Also, it has safety tips and other preparedness information. You can even make a plan right inside of the app as well. And it's totally and completely free. So just something to consider to uh, stay informed like we were talking about. And now we will talk about our thunderstorms. And first I have a video, which I believe is about five minutes about the storm that happened up here in Northern Michigan in 2015. A lot of you might remember it. Actually, I think it was the most expensive storm to date uh, in this area, so. I'm Randy Chamberlain, I'm chef owner of Leland I'm pretty much a native of Leland in Grand Traverse County. Been here since I was five years old. It was a Sunday at three o'clock. It still looked beautiful. The sun was out. There was a little wind, but it was, I was like uh, telling the service team, set up the patio, we're gonna use it tonight. I mean, I stood right at this door, watching the sky turn black and the clouds just rolling. A visual that you've probably seen things on TV. Maybe they weren't even, uh, you know, real things on TV. They were in a movie or something. And then it got really dark, and then the wind started. I remember looking at the islands here, uh, south and north Manitou, and seeing, you could see just a wall coming in, and then all of a sudden it eclipsed the islands, and you couldn't see the islands. Within a minute, we were, we were in it. So from the islands, five, six miles away, to right here, it took a minute, maybe two, and I stood here and watched the whole thing. And then, um, then the rain came. We, we, these trees right here were almost laying down horizontal, just from the force of the wind, the pressure. The, the windows felt like they were just rattling. And at that point, the power went out, and it was as dark as night for about two minutes. It was a fascinating uh, visual. In about five minutes, the, the, the sun was out, the wind was gone, about an hour went by and was really understanding the gravity of what had happened, the severity of it. And I thought, well, we're not opening tonight. Um, some people were telling us that we were all trapped, we couldn't get out of whatever. And then I just said, I'm thinking of all the people that are here in trouble. I have this food, let's figure this out. So they have a generator and, and propane at the town hall. And so I, I know the kitchen there and I said, let's, let's take what we got. And we took some extra things. We took some pasta. We made some spaghetti sauce real quick over there. And so we had spaghetti and pasta sauce and we had duck on feet. We had salad, we had dessert. I think there was 150 or 200 people there and they were all just as still stunned as we were Whatever anybody had to help with, if you had a chainsaw, you were helping somebody cut a tree off their house. If you had a boat, you were going out to get somebody's dock that flew out in the lake. Everybody was doing what they could to help. And we threw food. It was an amazing experience to see how grateful people were. For the entire week of being closed, we were part of this community and still continuing to do what we could to help seeing how everyone else was helping each other it was very refreshing to see the help that people were receiving and giving all right so that was a huge storm that happened in uh northern Michigan in 2015 but gave a really good idea of you know, how fast thunderstorms can come into the area and how much damage they can do in like a really short amount of time. And if you're wondering, the Red Cross did uh, also respond to that storm back in 2015 and provided people some supplies to uh, help and clean up their, their houses and their properties. So 
anyways, though, um, talking more about thunderstorms, if you didn't know, every thunderstorm produces lightning, but they can also produce hail, strong winds, uh, really heavy rain, and even evolve into tornadoes or flash flooding. But a thunderstorm is only considered severe if it produces hail that is at least one inch in diameter or has wind gusts of at least 58 miles per hour or if a tornado develops. And hail at that size can be dangerous safety and could also damage plants, roofs, and vehicles. And winds at that speed are also very dangerous and are capable of knocking over trees, ripping large branches off of trees, damaging utility poles, and potentially causing widespread power outages. And we all know that lightning is also dangerous. Lightning can strike as far away as 10 miles away from where the rain is actually falling during a thunderstorm. And lightning can actually also happen without any rainfall at all, which is called uh, dry lightning. And this is also pretty dangerous, not only just because it's lightning, but also because wildfires can spark uh, off of that lightning. So um, on average though, there are 25 million lightning strikes a year, causing injuries to about 300 people and killing about 80 people. But thankfully, most lightning strike victims survive, although some of them do suffer various long-term debilitating effects from the lightning. So earlier we talked about being informed and understanding different water alerts, which is very important um, when it comes to thunderstorms. So weather forecasters use two type of, types of alerts to describe the potential for severe thunderstorms, a watch and a warning. So a severe thunderstorm watch is issued when conditions are favorable for severe thunderstorms to develop. So if a watch is issued, you'll want to, you know, make sure you keep informed, keep listening to the radio, uh, keep watching the local news so that you can gauge whether this is going to become more intense. And you want to be ready to move to a safe place, you know, if that does occur. You know, for example, maybe you're driving somewhere. You'll want to keep listening to the radio to make sure that uh, you're not driving into a huge storm. So a the severe thunderstorm warning is issued when a severe thunderstorm is already spotted on the weather radar or when there's reports of what we talked about earlier, the hail that's greater than one inch in diameter or winds exceeding 58 miles an hour. So a severe thunderstorm warning is usually in effect for about an hour or so. And a lot of times they're combined with a flash flood warning or a tornado warning. So if you hear the warning being issued, that's when you should seek safe shelter immediately if you're not already in safe shelter. And just a note that a severe thunderstorm warning is not always issued after a thunderstorm watch. Sometimes thunderstorms are just so unpredictable and fast that it doesn't leave any time to issue that warning or that watch before the warning is issued. Like in that video, for example. <laughs> and then changing up your planning and preparation to make it more specific for thunderstorms. Um, specifically recommend that your disaster kit has working flashlights and extra batteries. Since we see so many power outages, when it comes to thunderstorms. You should also, you know, tailor your plan for what you and your household will do during a severe thunderstorm. You want to, you know, think about what your house is like, for an example, and whether that's somewhere that's safe for you to take, you know, shelter in. And I mean, always make sure that you include your pets as well. You know, thunderstorms are one of those disasters that tend to really, um, scare pets. Um, so that's something to take into account as well. And you want to make sure you're talking to the members in your household about severe thunderstorms. Make sure they understand, you know, 
want to watch and a warning is and where to go if so that they can stay safe. Um, and we're going to talk about, you know, even more safety tips later on in this presentation. So you just want to make sure that everyone in your house knows that all this information so that they can be as safe as possible. And I'll say it one more time. We do recommend that you have some type of radio to listen to just in case that power does go out and you have, you know, no access to your phone or a TV. So you can use a radio always in an emergency. And then as far as planning ahead and protecting your home specifically, there's a few things that you can do. You can make trees and shrubs more wind resistant by keeping their branches trimmed. You can consult with your local fire department about installing lightning rods, if that's something that you want to do. Um, also ensure that any buildings that house animals, if you have like barns or you have a chicken coop, for example, are protected in the same ways that you protect your home. Make a list of items that you need to secure or bring inside your home before a thunderstorm strikes and ensure that your rain gutters are free of debris. Also consider uh, purchasing flood insurance as often homeowners insurance doesn't typically cover any type of flood uh, or rain damage. So that is definitely something to consider. A lot of the people that the Red Cross works with after disasters often don't have insurance, which definitely makes recovery from a disaster a lot more difficult than it would have been if you had that uh, funds in place for a disaster. We all think that's never gonna happen to us, but it does happen and it always catches people off guard. So always good to prepare just in case. And if you want to, you can get more information about flood insurance at floodsmart.gov. So as far as during a thunderstorm, when it's occurring, the best place to go during a thunderstorm is inside a sturdy building. If you can hear thunder, you are close enough to be struck by lightning. Uh, so that's why you wanna get inside of a sturdy building. So once you're inside, you wanna make sure you shutter your windows and close all the doors securely. And then you wanna stay away from those locations and stay away from porches or decks as well. You can also unplug your appliances and other electronics to protect them from power surge damage and avoid contact with anything that conducts electricity, including metal window frames, landline phones. Uh, I know I still do have a landline actually. Um, so avoid those, Using water, plumbing, and electrical equipment because electricity can travel through plumbing and phone lines. And that's something I actually learned you know, from doing this job, um, I thought, you know, I was per perfectly safe taking a shower during a thunderstorm and turns out you should not do that. That can be potentially dangerous. So what about if you're outside when a thunderstorm strikes and you can't get inside of a sturdy building? You can still do some things that are, will protect you. One is avoiding open spaces, isolated tall objects, trees, hilltops, ridges, or any like metal objects, again, because of the lightning risk and also just high winds as well. You wanna stay out of places like picnic shelters, dugouts, or sheds. Those are not considered you know, a safe shelter to stay in. So try and seek some type of alternative shelter. If you're swimming or boating, you want to stop immediately and find shelter. And one note about you know, swimming or boating as well is you wanna be aware of those warnings too. So we talked about our watches and our warnings for thunderstorms, but oftentimes there's those small craft adv advisories or specific wind advisories that apply specifically when you're on a boat. Um, so try and be aware of those if you are a frequent boater. 
You can also, if you're outside during a thunderstorm, get inside of a car, but it should be a hard top car. So not a convertible or maybe like an open sided Jeep. You wouldn't want to get in one of those, just a hard top car. And it is still possible for you to be injured if lightning does strike your car, but you're just much safer inside of that vehicle than outside in the storm. So what about if you're driving in your car when a thunderstorm strikes? Well, first you have your car emergency kit, right? Yes, <laughs> but you want to safely exit the roadway, park and turn off uh, the ignition. And if you have that hard top and the hard sides, you can stay in your, you should stay in your vehicle, turn on your emergency flashers, you know, make sure your doors and windows are shut and your sunroof as well and try not to touch any metal surface until the thunderstorm ends. The National Weather Service recommends that you stay inside for at least 30 minutes after you hear the last sound of thunder during a thunderstorm. And then after a thunderstorm has occurred, there can still be additional heavy rain and strong winds. So you definitely wanna watch out for that. Use extra caution while you're driving because there can be debris, wind, rain, and traffic lights can also be out, which makes it you know, a lot of And never drive through a flooded roadway because you can't predict how deep or how potentially dangerous the water is. So at the Red Cross, we say, turn around, don't drown, which is something that will come up again in our flood presentation as well. Um, keep away from loose or downed power lines as well. Um, those can be extremely dangerous and just report them to the power company so that they can take care of them. And also be careful around, you know, even your own pets or any other pets that are outside because thunderstorms can make, give them a lot of anxiety and make them very scared. So any pets outside. If your house has been directly hit by lightning, you can call the fire department and ask them to check for hot spots in your walls or your roof or your attic. After the fire department has thoroughly checked your home, you want to make sure that your smoke alarms are still operating properly and you can even have a licensed electrician, you know, come and check the wiring just to totally make sure that everything is okay. If you happen to be with someone or come across someone who has been struck by lightning themselves, you want to immediately call 911. Lightning strike victims don't retain any type of electrical charge though, so you can give them first aid uh, immediately until EMS arrives on the scene. So you'll want to check them and make sure um, that they're still breathing. And if they've stopped breathing, you'll want to begin CPR immediately. Um, if they're breathing normally, you can check for other injuries and just care for them as needed. Um, we are having a hands-only CPR presentation um, later in October. So if that interests you, um, you know, anyone can perform hands-only CPR. So, I'll just plug that there. <laughs> um, as far as thunderstorms, that is our last slide on there. I always like to put our own Red Cross phone number in here. This is our national phone number that you can call or anyone else can call if you've experienced a disaster. You know, if you've had a home fire, something like that, you can call this number to see if you know, the Red Cross can provide you some assistance. This will connect you, you know, with a real person. And then your information that you give during that phone call will be pushed to a real local person uh, like me, for example, in Northern Michigan. So I just like to inform people about that because not everybody knows that this is something that they can do. And then my last slide here is just asking you to join us for some of our other presentations that we have going on at the library for National Preparedness Month. 
And if you're interested in volunteering with our local Red Cross here in Northern Michigan, I have our volunteer services um, liaisons email there down at the bottom. Um, also, I will say I um, there was a few questions included on the initial email about this presentation. Um, that is something I ask for my AmeriCorps program. So if you don't mind filling that out, if you haven't already, that would be great. Actually, we ask that you fill it out twice. So you're supposed to fill it out before the presentation and then after the presentation so that we can gauge you know, how much learning went on during the presentation. So if you would do that, that would be absolutely helpful to me. But other than that, I thank you guys all for coming. Um, I don't know if there's any questions or anything, Betsy, or any comments. Um, that's the end of my slides. So. I don't see anything yet, but if uh, anyone has any questions, just utilize the chat um, and, and we'll get them answered that way. Um, the only comment I have is, oh yeah, next week is floods, which is great. And this prepare with Pedro, that's for kids, right? Yes, yes, yeah. so that's our kids program for like kindergarten through second grade kids. Although if you have, um, you know, third grade kids, it would be fine too. Um, just wouldn't, I don't think older, older kids would probably be too into Pedro. It's a little storybook about Pedro, who is a penguin. And he's learning all about what a home fire is and how he can be better prepared for, you know, one if it were to happen. So yeah, that's probably our favorite my, or my favorite program uh, that we do. I've really enjoyed it <laughs> over the years. Is the, um, the kits that you prepare for all of these, I'm just thinking back to last week's um, presentation as well as this one, are the kits for the most part pretty much the same and then just a couple of things added to each one, you know, to be like one for thunderstorms. Um, I'm curious at the end of this whole series if I'll go back to each slide and see how much they change, those kits change, either the go bag or just what you have ready. In your oh, house. yeah. So prepare with Pedro, the like younger kids presentation. We kind of talk about, you know, the basics, um, you know, having, you know, making a plan with like, all the grown-ups in your family and stuff like that and how to escape and because sometimes kids get really scared during particularly home fires and instead of trying to escape the house they just panic so that's kind of a big part of the home fire program there but for the younger kids we definitely have a much more basic program and it's put in that storybook format but we do have a very cool uh, program for our like older kids, which is called the Pillowcase Project, where they actually, um, everyone gets a pillowcase, <laughs> which sounds a little strange, um, but it's actually based on one of the Red Cross's own volunteers who went down to Hurricane Katrina. And she saw a bunch of young college students who had evacuated and they packed all of their belongings up into pillowcases. <laughs> and she thought, wow, that was kind of really smart of them. Everyone pretty much has a pillowcase. So that's where the program evolved into. So everyone gets a pillowcase and we ask them to color it with fabric markers, with you know their favorite colors, things that make them feel comfortable, things that make them feel happy. And then they take that home and pack it with, you know, the same type of emergency supplies that uh, we talked about in this presentation. You know, maybe a few things would be different. We always like to mention that they can put, you know, a stuffed animal or some other item, like a really good book or maybe like some cards, things like that, so they can play a game with their family. But that pillowcase is you know, something that they can take with them if there was a disaster. And not only does it have all of their supplies and they're taking, you know, a lot of doing this very independent thing of packing their own stuff, um, but it's also covered in, you know, all that, all those good, like feeling memories, the favorite color, all of those comforting things. 
that can hopefully make them feel better, feel more comfortable in the event of a disaster. So that's another really cool program too uh, that we do with a lot of focus on you know, that emergency kit. Does that, yes. <laughs> did that answer your question? <laughs> yeah, well, it answered the question for kids for sure. Um, uh, my question was more for like the parents when they do a kit for home for all of these disasters. It seems like they, it's probably the basics and then maybe a couple other things depending on what one. Yeah. What, like, I don't know. I can't even think. Uh, but like I said, as soon as the program's over, I'm going to go back and look at each slide and see what's different. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'd have like kind of those general recommendations, but I feel like the best way to go about it is, you know, even kind of like a seasonal check on like your supplies, you know, once like winter's over, you can kind of be like, okay, we don't need, like I have a kit in my car, for example. So like in the winter, I have like extra hat and like gloves in there in case I have to like shovel myself out or something like that but in the summertime like I don't need those in there really <laughs> I mean maybe I would wear the hat if I it was like a really cold like night or something but I don't need the snow gloves <laughs> I probably don't need like you know the kitty litter <laughs> for like the icy snow or stuff like that so that's like kind of an easy way to go like seasonally um, and just like refresh things that um, you don't really need in there anymore. Take out the granola bars and swap them out for like something else. That makes sense. That's great. Well, it doesn't look like there's any questions. I appreciate you coming again this week and we'll see you again next week when we talk about floods. So I appreciate that. Yeah, thanks for having me. <laughs> You're welcome.